Welcome to Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. Legal issues simplified through real client stories and real world experiences. Creating simplicity in three, two, one. Welcome back to another episode of Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. I'm your host, Brad Dotto, my co host, Michael Bird. Thanks, Brad. As a business and healthcare law firm, we meet many interesting people in various stages of their business. Yeah. This season, we get to focus on the high stakes implications of selling a business or buying a business. Yeah. This season's theme is the Hitchhiker's Guide to M&A. We will be guest heavy and bring in different professionals to offer their experiences and perspectives in M&A. Yeah, and for those who don't know the vocabulary word M&A, it actually stands for mergers and acquisitions. What does that really mean? So legal jargon for buying and selling a business or buying and selling all the assets of a business. Good job, Brad. Thank you for not embarrassing yourself or me with your definition. Uh, well, actually, I don't feel like I've done anything to embarrass myself lately, but I think it's time, Michael, maybe for you to be very vulnerable in our, and talk to our audience and tell about your issues of being a picky eater. Brad, it's not that I'm a picky eater. The issue is condiments. Fine, Michael. Um, confess to the audience your relationship with condiments. Well, it's not so much a confession as a public service announcement. Mayonnaise is the spawn of Satan. <laughs> um, all right, Michael, tell us how you really feel about mayonnaise. Well, it's not just the mayonnaise. My relationship with condiments is kind of both simple and complicated. At the simple level, I can't stand condiments. Um, it gets more complicated because I've added exceptions over the years. Oh, okay. So which condiments do you like? I like gravy and barbecue sauce, for example. I don't think gravy is really in the condiment family, but you do know that barbecue sauce is made up of mustard and ketchup, right? Exactly, Brad. That's what I meant by complicated. Okay. I can't stand mustard. I can't I can't stand ketchup. It's probably a little strong. I don't like ketchup. Uh, uh, but for some reason, I like barbecue sauce. And I actually still am carrying some stuff against my Uncle Jimmy because – when uh, third grade Michael was at a big family Fourth of July barbecue, and uh, th- my uncle was making the Bird family barbecue sauce, I discovered that this barbecue sauce that I loved, how it was made, I saw him squeezing mustard <laughs> and ketchup into a bowl, and I was significantly scarred. I could barely eat it that day, and but I made a I made a business decision that day. Right? That- like, okay, I know I like the taste of this already just got to suppress it and uh, forget how it's made. So I guess if we're doing mathematics here or science, so two negative condiments make a positive condiment. Um, Are there any other weird, I mean, complicated scenarios where you like condiments? I don't mind eating condiments if it, if it's uh, in something cooked. So if I, especially if I don't see it being cooked in it, so I know there's lots of dishes. <laughs> my wife, still. I know, I know. My my wife makes lots of dishes that have sour cream and cream cheese in them, <laughs> and that's fine. I've learned to accept it, kind of like the barbecue sauce. Like it tastes good, and I just don't like to. I just don't think about how it was made. Hey Riley, do we still have any gold stars for Michael? I mean, I'm so proud of you that you <laughs> would eat condiments that are cooked in the meal. I'm I'm glad you're having fun with this. Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, and we won't even get in. Well, we we'll move on. Let's All right. let's turn the tables a little bit because you have not nearly as weird as that. But you, on the other end, you have to have three square meals a day. Yep. I mean, so much so, and uh, we've known each other for forever now. I know that at all times you have snacks readily handy handy in case there's a threat for a meeting to extend. Look, into a as a as a resident hobbit, we're used to eating six to eight meals a day. I've out, I'm pretty proud of myself. I'm down to three squares a day. But yeah, if I miss one of those meals, yeah, I'm done for the day. Yeah, I've I've seen it happen. And you turn you turn very mean. I get very hangry. Yes. Okay. Well, but but you like lots of things, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we're gonna put that to the test because this conversation in our prep was inspired by an article I found uh, with the top these five. Are worst foods according to the disgusting food museum are you like the founder of that (laughs) i i I wish but you would know i was a founder because mayonnaise would be number one that's true okay yeah so you gotta you know brace yourself to have 
it, this is pretty disgusting. These are the top five worst. Okay. Foods. You ready? I'm nervous. Yeah. Okay. You should be. Okay. Number one is something called gamutra. And I don't know if I said it right. By the way, this is pure. I didn't look up how to pronounce any okay. of these. You're good. And they're all foreign. So it's no it one will know the difference. But I can tell you what gamutra is. This is cow urine from India. And drinking gamutra has been practiced for thousands of years. It's and especially like the cow urine of a pregnant cow is considered especially potent and has hormones and minerals. Yeah, okay, no. Okay. The next one is called two teas tonsil. And this is gonna sound good to you at first. It it's a it's a traditional Korean medicine with nine percent alcohol content. Uh, I like it so far. Okay. The feces of a human child between the age of four and seven is refrigerated for several days, mixed with water, and then fermented. Through a continual and disgusting process, <laughs> the drink is made to be kind of a taste sour, uh, kind of similar to rice wine. And the most disturbing part of what I read about this was and, and, uh, that it can leave a poo smell on your breath. <laughs> What? I know. Am I going to respond to that one? Okay, baby mouse wine. <laughs> yes, this is a drink in China where at least a dozen baby mice are drowned in rice wine. And the mice must be blind and hairless. And the brew has to mature for at least a year before drinking. And the mouse wine is drunk as a health tonic for asthma and liver diseases. Yeah, I'd rather have that. It's a good thing we have a doctor in the house because yes. we'll be able to test whether that's, that, that's real. Uh, therapy for that uh the fourth is monkey brain which we've all kind of heard of it's it's kind of a potentially just a legend we don't no one knows for sure if this is actually a thing but according to legend waiters at a restaurant would feed people monkey brain and the monkey would be alive like they'd have it affixed under the table and uh and then finally brad i know you're gonna like this one virgin boy eggs Young boys, urine is collected in buckets, and then the eggs are boiled in the urine. The eggs are then cracked and continue to boil so that the urine can soak into the eggs. The golden eggs smell strongly of urine, but the taste has been described as delicate, salty, and addictive. Yeah, I'm pretty right. disgusted by you right now. You're not, you just said you could eat anything. I, I, you know, I always thought it was very adventurous. I mean... When I travel to other places, I'll try anything, generally speaking. I've had haggis. I've had snails. Um, I've had uh, um, live shrimp that was staring at you as you ate it. Ooh, body. Um, so I've tried lots of different dishes, but everything you described so far, I 100% am out. Um, yeah. But let's, you know, we have our guests or those watching us on YouTube are probably wondering why we have this really gorgeous person sitting next to you and we we're talking about these disgusting things. So maybe – she didn't leave. She didn't leave. That's good. Which is good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's good. It. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. And, and it's it, what's weird is that mayonnaise would still be number one on that list. <laughs> like it's crazy. Okay. We're bringing Rachel Walker in. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So Rachel's a friend and a client. And uh, we all just got a little bit closer yes. because of that conversation. Yes. <laughs> uh, Rachel is a board certified plastic surgeon. She's the owner of the Plastic Surgery Center of Dallas. She purchased this practice in 2019. She was born and raised in Oklahoma, went to University of Oklahoma Medical School, residency at the University of Missouri, and did her fellowship with the Wall Center in Shreveport. And uh, I, not ironically, she is a dog lover, but ironically, she is a foodie after what we just talked about. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today, Rachel. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, well, Rachel, this season, we're really concentrating the Hitchhiker's Guide of MNA. And that's our theme. And, you know, I guess before we really, really get, get getting into this, as Michael says, you're supposedly a foodie. But um, of those top five worst foods that Michael just mentioned, are any of those ones that you would eat? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Very answer. All right, Michael, I think, you know, for our audience, maybe, you know, we, everyone knows you love context. Give us a summary of, um, the, you know, in different seasons of businesses that eventually get into potential of the m a phase and to talk to everyone about that just giving them a, a reminder a recap yeah i mean this is hopefully helpful to orient everyone and why we're even doing this season yeah. and how you know the conversation we'll have with rachel and what her journey has been will be applicable for those yeah. that at some point will be affected by m a 
So every business is in, you know, one of four seasons. They're in the building season. Think of it like creating the infrastructure to your business. Yeah. Often at the beginning, that's part of it, but it comes around at different points. The operating season is the day-to-day stuff. Think of processes. This is times when, you know, your crisis come up. That's a big part of the operating season, the unexpected um, you know, issue that yeah. arises. And then there's a season where you're scaling your business. You may be adding people, you may be adding locations, you may be adding services, but there is this intentional reinvestment or investment into the scaling of your business. Yeah. And then the final season is the buying and selling of a business. Yeah. And, uh, and that's kind of where we're camped out today. Although the other seasons have an impact on M and a for sure. sure. Yeah. When we talk about M and a, we always talk about the five phases. We're really just condensing this timeline of the M and a process, but the M and a, you know, process, these five phases are start with a letter of intent or the LOI. We talked about that on prior episodes and due diligence which we've talked about and that's the heavy stuff. Yes. Then we get into the definitive agreements. That's the actual stuff that we do in writing and negotiating contracts. Then we go to closing, uh, the big champagne toast, and then the post-closing cleanup that happens after an M&A deal. Uh, For today's show, we're going to spotlight Rachel's story and lessons learned as someone who bought a business as a way to start a practice. Yeah. So Rachel, um, again, thanks for being here, but let's get into your story. You know, how did you become, or what drove you to become an owner of your own practice right out of fellowship training? I've always had a really specific idea of what I wanted my practice to look like. So I knew I wanted to treat patients a little differently and provide a more luxury experience. And that can be difficult to do within another person's organization or within a hospital. Um, I have absolutely zero business background. So I wasn't a hundred percent sure I wanted to open my own business. And honestly, it came down to, I was looking at real estate in Dallas to maybe just rent a clinic space, not, not go big. Mm-hmm. And it was impossible to find a building with sinks and good parking. Mm. So I decided to branch out. And that's when I found a few practices for sale. And I thought about it. I was like, if I can learn how to operate on people, if I can learn to put a finger back on a hand, I can definitely learn to run a business. And if not, what's the worst that can happen? And in my mind, I decided the worst that could happen was bankruptcy because I wasn't going to die if my business failed. I wasn't going to do anything else worse than bankruptcy. And I was pretty confident that I still had employable skills if I did fail. So at the end of the day, I chose to go in on my own and purchase a practice. Man, that's going all with a very in bankruptcy being the worst case scenario. That's pretty good. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and I'm sure, of course, you know, we were there with you at that time. And, and it is, you know, for the audience to understand, it is a unique way for someone to start. Most of the times when doctors do what Rachel did, they've been in, in business for some degree of time. To, um, you know, what talk about what that experience was like for you when you were, you know, kind of you, you found this practice for sale and what, what was that process like for you? Well, I found the practice and then it was a matter of what would this practice do for me or what am I actually buying? And at the end of the day, this practice, one thing I knew I was buying is eventually I wanted the building and I wanted the location. So I knew I had that at the end. So as long as I could keep things going so that I could buy the building, uh, that was my end game. Uh, I looked at online presence, reviews and how patients were coming into the practice and it had great traffic. And it had great visibility. So in my mind, if I worked hard and really poured myself into the business, I would be able to grow it to the point that I could use that wonderful building to be as good as it should be. Um, So I think that was kind of my thought process. Yeah. So you went through it, you closed, and now all of a sudden you have the keys to a business. Uh, Talk about the experiences and lessons you learned after you started operating your own practice? I learned a lot. I got kicked in the teeth several times starting out. Um, I opened November 1, 2019, had zero patients. I had one employee that was remaining from the previous surgeon because he had kind of really leaned things out for his final years. 
and she was also eight months pregnant. So I knew that I had to find somebody pretty quickly uh, before she went on maternity leave. And I spent the first month of practice answering phones, pretending to be Laura, the <laughs> pregnant employee, and really trying to figure out how to make things work. Uh, I bought QuickBooks for dummies so I could learn to run payroll and really spent all of my time before I had patients trying to learn business. And then I also decided to remodel the practice because I wanted it to look like my practice and not like the previous surgeon's practice. So I started a remodel in about January, finished it up in March and had this beautiful facility. At this point, I had hired two wonderful employees and we were feeling good about ourselves. Phones were ringing. I was starting to get some traction. Well, then COVID hit mm. and got completely shut down. And at this point, I had not even paid myself. So looking at a PPP loan wasn't really an option because I had two employees who were on hourly wages and then me who was getting paid zero dollars. So that was a definite speed bump for me. Oh my goodness. And so you uh, you had COVID hit and um, and then was it was the winter freeze the next year after that? Yes. Um, oh February, as uh, February, March have historically not been very kind to me. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, a year after my remodel completed, uh, the f winter storm hit Dallas and flooded my practice, not once, but twice. Uh. So in 36 hours, it got flooded. Um, I lost all of my 11 month old floors oh. and my 11 month old painted cabinets. So uh, my team had to go through the remodel again, which was an adventure and a costly adventure, but luckily I had great insurance. So in terms of the remodel cost, at least I didn't have to eat that again. <laughs> I guess the first question is in 2024, is your practice to be closed the month of February just to like hedge your bets? I mean, I kind of think about it. I'm like maybe <laughs> team trip to Aruba and just hang out. <laughs> yeah. Just put a lot of like, like just wrap the entire building. Yeah. Make sure it's bubble wrap. Yeah. Yeah. Bubble wrap. <laughs> yeah. I staged the building this year and, <laughs> February and March. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, I mean, so coming out of your fellowship, you're, you're figuring out how to do run your business. You're, you, you run into COVID, you run into a freeze. Um, that had to be really hard on yourself. Um, obviously you were the face of the practice. So your employees were looking at you for the, the help, but you know, what did you learn about yourself during that time frame? I learned that you can always learn something at the end of the day, just because you don't know, you have to just execute and you will learn along the way. Mm -hmm. So I know more about plumbing. I know more about electricity. I know more about getting people to show up for a job than I ever thought I would know. Um, I think just knowing that you can do hard things is important. And luckily my team felt this exact same way. Mm -hmm. Like there were times that my uh, practice manager and patient coordinator, Madison was sitting in a hallway with a laptop and one light checking patients in with paint fumes around. And we knew we could still provide a great patient experience, even though our building said that we were really kind of sketchy people because <laughs> um, it didn't look great, but we still treated patients the same and knew there was light at the end of the tunnel. I think uh, not letting obstacles take you down is super important. And um, I've kind of picked up this really depressing mantra that life is pain. <laughs> and I'm actually a true optimist, but it, it makes it a little easier when these hard things happen. You're like, well, I mean, at the end of the day, there's things that happen and you just have to figure out how to get past them. Sounds like a Ted Lasso quote. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Just so it sounds like you enjoy it, though. I mean, you really enjoy being being your own boss. Yes, it's been fun. It's fun to create and it's fun to grow with people. It's fun to grow with your patients, grow with your team. I mean, that's something that I didn't even know that I would love as much, but learning to grow team members within your practice and helping other people reach their goals has been a lot of fun for me. And going back to, we'll go back in history, when you were moving to the Dallas area trying to find a practice, you weren't looking to be your own boss uh, 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 per se, right? Correct. I was not, I did not want to be my own boss. Um, I was like, oh, it's intimidating enough to just go out and operate and being the own boss of your patients, much less your own boss of you and your employees. I started listening to a lot of business podcasts, which I think helped me and reading a lot of business books. And I think I was just really dogged in learning how to do it right and wanted to improve every day, which kept me going because it was, it was like you were trying to climb a mountain. Yeah. But honestly, in business ownership, I don't think you ever get to the top. Yeah. You just have new goals. The mountain just keeps getting higher. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, that's great that you're a constant seeker of knowledge. I mean, that that's so helpful because if you weren't, you would, you would have been happy with just, you know, not a lot of doctors are happy just seeing right below them, which is this, the patient in front of them. And then they're done when they're, they're done the day, they want to go home, but that doesn't sound like you're you at all. No. <laughs> Well, and, and I, I can't help just listening to your story. Um, I don't even know if I've said this to you before, but the inspiration for us to finally take the leap and start Vertidato was seeing our clients like you over the years who would take that leap and take the risk and see and hear kind of that passion, even though there was pain, <laughs> no doubt. And we experienced ours along the way too. But I, I still, even after starting our own and thinking, why didn't we do it sooner? Love hearing, you know, our continued clients who take that. Leap. Yeah. And I'm always impressed with like for me yeah, and I, we cheat a little bit because we, we feed off each other. You're on your own. I mean, I, I have to teach them a lot. It's kind of, <laughs> it's, everybody knows anyway, but having that partner to, to be able to talk to, do you, do you have certain advisors that you surround yourself besides or not a law firm, but did you have other people that you're like, Hey, how did you doc? How did you handle this? Who are those resources or did you have those resources? Early on, I really didn't, but I was super blessed in my training that I had great mentors around me, mm -hmm. uh, particularly uh, my fellowship mentors, the walls. They have been a great sounding board for me and connected me with like minded people. So even though in Dallas, I'm largely alone and I spend my day alone without a partner next to me, I have people to reach out with and commiserate with, which is really therapeutic at the end of the day, <laughs> but also helps you see problems outside of just your little tunnel vision and helps me think about it in a different way. So now I think I just keep building community and it's nice. Like I love doing things like this podcast or speaking at the residence meeting because you meet more people who are wanting to do the same thing. And maybe they're younger and have better ideas than me or they're older and they've been doing it. And so of course they are a lot wiser than I am. So have great tips for me. So those connections are super valuable. That's awesome. Well, as we near the end, I'd love to kind of get your words of advice you would have for our physicians in the audience who are maybe thinking about purchasing their own practice. I think make sure you're looking at all of your options. I looked at a couple of practices prior to purchasing this one. And this one had a great reputation and had great bones. It, I mean, bones of the building. I didn't have to worry about hopping locations. It had great web presence that was super useful to me. They had been there for a long time. So it. a lot of people will say there's no goodwill in buying a practice. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of patients who are like, oh, 10 years ago, I had my breast dog done at Plastic Surgery Center of Dallas, and I was comfortable there. And there's something comforting about coming back to that same practice, even though it's different. And I knew in my heart of hearts that I could build a team and a practice that if someone just set their foot in the door, they would have a good experience and we could retain them. Mm -hmm. um, I also think just knowing yourself at the end of the day, if you don't want to manage people, if you don't want to really make your business your life, I think it's probably not a great idea to start your own practice by your own practice because you really have to be passionate about it and you have to love the creation process mm -hmm. and you have to be willing to work when you're not busy. So I think of all the times like COVID shut down um, or just times I've been slow and worried like, Oh my gosh, am I ever going to have business? And I've tried to find ways to make the practice better and I still show up to work and I still do all the things. It's just what can make you different. And you have to have a very clear vision about what you are building so that you do have a brand because without a brand, no one's going to come find you. That's amazing. Um, and it, as we wrap up for uh, today, first of all, I'll say thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for yeah, inviting me. We're so, so grateful to have you. Um, and what we'll do is we'll go to break. And then on the other side, uh, Brad and I'll come back and, and have a little bit of a legal wrap up. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you. Many business owners use legal counsel as a last resort rather than as a proactive tool that can further their success. Why? For most, it's the fear of unknown legal costs. Bird Adato's Access Plus program makes it possible for you to get the ongoing legal assistance you need for one predictable monthly fee. That gives you unlimited phone and email access to the legal team so you can receive feedback on legal concerns as they arise. Access Plus, a smarter, simpler way to access legal services. 
Find out more. Visit birdadato.com today. Welcome back to Legal 123s with Birdado. I'm your host, Brad Adato. I'm still here with our co-host, Michael Bird. And, and as those who are watching, we all notice the gorgeous woman who is sitting next to Michael is no longer here because now we're getting into the legal aspects of it in the podcast. And, you know, for as a reminder, Michael, this season, our theme is the Hitchhiker's Guide to M&A. Today's show, um, you know, we really we're concentrating on on buying a practice. Um, and Rachel, Dr. Rachel Walker, who joined us, she had an interesting story that she was able to share with us and the uh, ups and downs of running a practice and the getting kicked in the teeth a couple of times between COVID and water breaches and other things. But uh, what, are your, what are some recaps that you have today? Yeah, I mean, it, it, again, kind of orienting this uh, story to the broader picture of the Hitchhiker's Guide to M&A is, uh, you know, you have uh, Dr. Walker, Rachel was in the season of business of creating, yeah. starting from scratch. She could start her own business. So it, and, and so she started kind of in that season of the buying and selling of a business because, you know, she, she could have, she had two choices. She could have started her own business and been kind of in that season of building your business, but she started to buy something that existed. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so, uh, there is, uh, the as the story unfolds she goes through that unique process and then is immediately hit with trial after trial in her first few years that you just mentioned yet what we both know and we probably should have spent more time talking with her about she wouldn't have uh, maybe bragged as much as we can on her is that her practice is thriving and she has a huge reputation in the dallas market and uh, and so it's a really cool story of uh, taking a risk, perseverance, and you know having success. Yeah, well, you know we, we talk about risk tolerance uh, all the time about you know those who are afraid to step out of the uh, of the shower in the morning, those who jump out of the airplane. I think Rachel's like just every day jumping out of the airplane. The way she's reacting because yeah, she said the worst thing that could happen would be bankruptcy. I mean that's a real entrepreneur's perspective of go get it and and as much as it it's hard. To run a business, um, she was able to do it in, in such extreme situations. But I think what's interesting about Rachel's story for our pod, our podcast listeners is we have been – and when we go to different trade shows, everybody wants to hear about PE, PE. What's PE doing? Is private equity really coming into this market? What's happening? What are the big sales like? Well, let's back up just you know three to four years ago. The vast majority of sales were doctor to doctors, and those sales could be an outside doctor coming along and – buying your practice or a bigger practice gobbling up your practice or maybe you have a younger doctor who's been working with you for two to five years and you want to sell a piece of your practice to them that has been the way in which most practices grew or sold in that season and so it's interesting to have rachel on because when people hear m a they think of these big transactions not that it wasn't but this was a doctor doctor deal ultimately it yeah i mean there's the sexiness to what we call the wall street deals yeah and yet we have Main Street deals happening every day, yeah. and it's a small business or small business owner buying a small business from someone else. And from a legal perspective, there's a lot of similarities mm-hmm. to the Wall Street deals, but there's also some differences. Yeah, and it's kind of easy to picture in a sense. Like you have a doctor that's in fellowship, has no business savvy. Like where do you even go to find a business? Mm-hmm. And then what do you do? And where do you get the money to buy it? And these are real things that you don't really think about on the Wall Street side of things. Of course, finding uh, a business to buy is is also a challenge there. But you know they have sophisticated mechanisms to finance or or uh, purchase a, a practice. Here you have you know Rachel and people like her are you know first how do I find find it? They go and literally hire a business broker, and uh, it may be. That business broker may also be marketing a uh, a dry cleaner mm-hmm. and other types of small businesses throughout the community, and you're just looking through listings trying to find someone selling a plastic surgery practice, and it can be challenging. and uh, And there are some brokers who have a focus on healthcare, but uh, that's the kind of the environment you see there, and so um, it causes when you're the buyer, uh, you have to understand that you may have a broker that doesn't understand healthcare really, and mm-hmm. all the regulations we talk about in some of the episodes. And so 
you're wanting to understand what you're buying. All the stuff we talked about in the five phases of M and A are still applicable. A different scale on a Main Street deal, but definitely still applicable. And uh, and then you know you're going to a bank typically to borrow the money or going to get an SBA loan, and that adds to your timeline because going through that process of getting a bank to say yes, we'll loan you this money to purchase a business is a is a pretty uh, unique uh, experience for these uh, Main Street deals. Yeah. So we're almost out of time today, Michael. So what any final thoughts you have? Well, these deals are all asset deals, and we've talked about these in prior SOs. Usually, they're asset deals, um, and that's you know in M and A, you're buying the assets and taking on certain liabilities, but you're not just stepping into everything, and so. It's really important you make sure that you exclude any mayonnaise that they have <laughs> in their kitchen when you're buying a practice like this. Well, I, you know, in all the years of practice, I've never heard that exclusion clause, but I could see you writing that in. Audience members, that's all the time we have today. We will be back with you next Wednesday as we continue through our journey to Hitchhiker's Guide to M&A, where we take a deep dive into dental market and understanding what's happening with that with our, our good friend, Mike White. Bertadato is providing this podcast as a public service. This podcast is for educational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute legal advice, nor does it establish an attorney-client relationship. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by Bertadato. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Please consult with an attorney on your legal issues.